talk I put together today is, 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 is going to be focused very much on, on sustainable fuels, sustainable fuel development, and uh, the challenges and opportunities in terms of, uh, in terms of that field uh, globally. Um, Carbon is everywhere, and the sustainable, I mean, the sustainable fuels are, are all about producing low carbon fuels. Carbon is everywhere, we rely on carbon, we can't exist without, uh, 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 without uh, carbon. But we know that when carbon is burned, when it's combusted, it's an issue. Uh, it uh, is an issue from the perspective of the accumulation of greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, uh, but it's also an issue, and, and this is something I'll touch on a bit later, in terms of the accumulation of pollutants in the atmosphere, particulate matter, SOX, NOx, etc. And, and perhaps the latter is becoming one of the key drivers for environmental legislation globally, uh, as much as uh, a uh, uh, sort of uh, efforts to abate climate change. So climate change happening, everybody gets it. We don't have to debate that anymore. So that's 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 nice. Um, uh, and uh, and all sectors, all high emission sectors, are, are being challenged to find ways to minimise their impact on on uh, on climate change, M minimise their emission of CO2 and the, and the accumulation of of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is. Uh, the transport sector in particular has come under a great deal of focus over the years. This is uh, some data released by uh, the en uh, International Energy Agency. Um, and what they did was say, well, if the transport sector was going to minimize or to, to become sustainable, it would have to have at least 30% of, uh, uh, of fuels to be, uh, to, 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 to be made from... Uh, low carbon resources or to be low carbon fuels. Uh, they use the word biofuel, I'll keep using the word low carbon and the reason for that will become very clear. Um, so 30%, 30% of the fuel pool being zero or low carbon fuels at least. What does that mean? Today the world consumes around 90 million barrels of oil a day. Um, it's a big number, it's Im unimaginable. Uh, so 30% of that is 1.2 uh, billion gallons, and I'll, use the, I'll, I'll keep using gallons because I now live in America and I've got to get used to it, so you, uh, you're, you're suffering that, uh, that uh, reality. Um, so 1.2 billion gallons of fuel a day, or 450 billion gallons annually, at least. And that's the number we need to remember. What, that is the scale, that is the size of the challenge for the sustainable or low carbon fuels industry. Biofuels internationally have grown, uh, particularly in recent years, as a result of government legislation th throughout the world um, mandating the use of fuels like biodiesel, like ethanol uh, in, in, the, in the fuel pool. Biodiesel is a completely fungible uh, material that, uh, that you can just blend with, uh, with diesel or run 100%. Ethanol is a blending agent you, uh, that you can blend up to, say, 10% in, in places like America. In fact, all gasoline in America is effectively 10% ethanol. Uh, in Brazil, all gasoline is effectively 20% ethanol or, or sometimes higher. Um, uh, you can use it as 100% fuel, but you have to have a different engine. 10 to, to 20%, you're, you're, you're fairly safe. Uh, but the point being, this legislation is, is there's legislation being uh, uh, driven globally for the use of, of, of fuels, and these, this legislation has driven uh, the growth of, of, the, of the industry. And again, throughout this talk, I'm going to highlight the word biofuel, and, uh, and, and the reason for that will become obvious also. We have a number of, 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 of strategies available to us uh, through which we can produce low carbon fuels. But the only mature technologies available today rely on the conversion of farmed resources, farmed uh, crops into, uh, into fuels. And uh, I'm talking about the production of ethanol and also the production of, of, of diesel from um, either sugars, starches and sugars, uh, or oils. There are other approaches that are being developed, and I'll talk, uh, in this talk, I'll focus a little bit about where, where those efforts are uh, globally. But in the first instance, uh, let's talk about what we have today. The mature technologies we have today allow the production of fuel ethanol um, and uh, uh, from 
a variety of, of substances, uh, maize, wheat, sugarcane, sugar beet, cassava, rice, etc., etc. In re so that sounds like it's a, it's a broad uh, basket of, of resources from which you can produce ethanol. In reality, in reality, about two, about three quarters of, of ethanol is produced from either corn in the U.S., um, uh, corn in the U.S., or sugar in Brazil. So 13.3 billion gallons of, of ethanol uh, produced in the U.S. from corn starch, 6.2 billion gallons produced in Brazil from sugarcane. That's 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 the status of play. That's the state of play today. So. We add those up and we remember our number, 450 billion gallons annually is our target. Not really close. <laughs> um, biodiesel production globally sits at around 5 billion gallons per annum. 5 billion gallons per annum and that is produced primarily from, I, I was surprised, rape uh, seed oils. Uh, but it's also produced uh, uh, palm and that's received a lot of controversy. When I put this slide deck together, I was actually surprised how little is produced from palm uh, relative to, to rapeseed oils and soybeans. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, these, are, these are farm goods and about 5 billion gallons there. The challenge with these feedstocks is that they are both expensive and price volatile. So this um, uh, slide here shows the price here of, in blue of, uh, of corn over a period from January uh, 2009 to, uh, to this year. This is the price of sugar uh, globally from the early 80s to um, about a couple of years ago. And what you see is it was volatile before, but recently it's become extremely volatile. And mainly that, that, in many ways, that's a result of, uh, of in part, some, some interest in climate activity recently, and in part as a result of the demand for fuels driven by uh, this legislative uh, market for fuels that's been created around the world. And I'll show a little bit about the difference in production over recent times. So these are expensive and these are price volatile. They're also controversial. So the use of corn, the use of sugar, uh, for the use of soybeans for the production of fuels raises this debate around food versus fuel. This is not a, a, a debate around the climate. This is a debate around the appropriate use of our resources. And uh, for me, I think this is a, a debate that will work itself out in the context of, uh, of demand. But what we should understand that is that the demand for fuels is going up. People predict that by uh, 2035, the demand for, for fuels will have increased by 40%. The, over that same period, the population's going up. So we know that uh, we're going to go from about 7 billion today to predicted around uh, uh, 8 point something billion in 2035. So the demand for food is also going to go up. Uh, yet the amount of land we've got is not, not exactly expanding on a daily rate. So, and the other thing we understand is today, for that 6 billion gallons, annual gallons of, of, of sugar ethanol that's produced in, in Brazil, that consumes around, broadly, 18% of sugars. So 18% of sugars are, are consumed today for fuel pr production. So already we start to understand that if the goal is 450 billion gallons annually, and today let's say all ethanol uh, is, uh, all biofuels are at uh, 20, uh, 29 billion gallons annually, then the distance between where we are today and our, and our target is great. That's where, that's where the opportunity is. But that opportunity is defined by the fact that we need new resources or new feedstocks from which to produce fuels. Fuel production is on the rise. So pointing to the data I showed earlier about the price volatility of uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the agricultural products that, from which we produce uh, fuels. Um, fuel production is on the rise. And in order to keep that, uh, that rate of, of growth going within this industry, we need to identify new feedstocks. So today's technologies are not enough. They're not going to be enough to, to hit 450 billion gallons annually. Um, new technologies are required to allow us to access new feedstocks and the lowest cost technologies will dominate. People don't like paying a lot for fuel, <laughs> basically. 
One of the, one of the, the strategies that's, that's, be, that's received a lot of attention over the years is the use, is, is, uh, is one to allow the production of, uh, of fuel ethanol from lignocellulose. So lignocellulosic biomass is effectively any plant that's not an algae or a moss. Yeah, so any plant that stands up is, uh, is composed of lignocellulose, lignin plus cellulose. Woody biomass is generally, broad brush, high level, is generally, thought to, is generally considered to be around 60% cellulose plus hemicellulose, 40% lignin. Cellulose is a polymer of, of sugars, so it's just literally a, 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 a chain of sugar, sugars. And lignin is, is, you can think of that as, as kind of green coal. It looks like coal. And, uh, uh, and so uh, what people are trying to do in, in this regard, in order to use this resource, is separate the lignin from the cellulose, a very challenging uh, ask, given that uh, 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 billions of years of evolution have uh, produced plants whose job it is to protect themselves from uh, invasion and, uh, and attack by binding lignin and cellulose together very closely sacrify the cellulose, i.e. take that polymeric uh, sugar chain and break it up into individual sugars, and then ferment those sugars. That's, that's what's required in order to allow us to access uh, lignocellulosic biomass. So a lignocellulosic biomass plant would look like something like this, whereby the, the, the biomass is brought in, and generally these plants focus on a specific crop, a specific source of biomass. So be it corn stover, uh, be it some woody biomass, but the technologies must uh, 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 are pretty much always developed around a specific source of biomass. Uh, we use uh, the, 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 the lignin and cellulose, are, uh, then, uh, lignin and cellulose polymers are then disrupted in some way, blown apart either by uh, a, a combination of harsh mechanical or chemical uh, treatments. Um, the cellulose is then broken down with enzymes. Uh, this has been a, a source of great expense for this industry, and uh, there's been a tremendous amount of money, particularly in the US, uh, brought to bear on bringing down in the cost of uh, cellulitic enzymes in order to, to reduce this, uh, this process step. And then uh, the resultant uh, um, uh, sugary solution, I suppose, is, is fermented. And a great deal of effort put into developing organisms that have uh, a tolerance to the various uh, inhibitory components that, that come through in this solution from, from, the, from the, the, the original biomass through that kind of harsh pretreatment, cellulose de degradation, uh, and fermentation. But the good news is, the really good news is that this year, this year sees the commercialization, the first ever, I mean, just to give you a sense of this, I've been going to uh, biofuels conferences for over 10 years. Every year, I, without, without exception, every year in the last 10 years, we've been, the, these conferences were finished with the prediction that within the next two years, we'll, be do, we'll, we'll have a commercial cellulose ethanol plant. Um, but this year, three, three have been built uh, in the US, and, and, we'll, and three will be operating by the end of this year. Those three uh, have been, but two are in Iowa, uh, and uh, one's in Kansas, and uh, one by DuPont, one by Abengoa, that's a Spanish, uh, originally it's a Spanish company, um, but the, the, they're operating obviously in the States, and, uh, and Project Liberty, love that name, uh, um, built by DSM and Poet. DSM are a, a kind of, uh, a, a, I guess, a biomaterial, bio, bio-agent bio manufacturer, so they, they, they develop enzymes and, and microbes for various industrial applications, and, uh, and Poet are a dyed-in-the-wool corn ethanol uh, producer, and uh, um, they've been in this game for a very long time. So this is, this is the start of this industry. But look at the scale of these plants. They're small. There's 30 million gallons, 25 million gallons, 25 million gallons. For a corn ethanol plant, that's small. People build, today, people build corn ethanol plants that are 100 million gallon per annum capacity. And, uh, but, but nevertheless, this is commercial. So, so and, and because these are the first plants of their kind, they won't be the best example uh, they're not the mature, the finished product of, of, a, of a cellulosic ethanol industry, but they're, they're, they're the necessary first step. They'll have all sorts of, of issues, they'll have all sorts of challenges, but they're going and they're, they're at some, some decent scale. The challenge for the lignocellulose to ethanol, lignocellulose to ethanol industry is one of OPEX, 
the operational costs associated with, uh, of, with the biomass, the cost of the biomass, the cost of the pretreatment, the cost of the, the, the cellulose degradation, uh, and, and that's got to be brought down. The capital cost, people are Rumor mill out there says that these plants have cost between ten and twenty dollars per annual gallon. So if you've got a, it means if you're at ten dollars per annual gallon, you're producing thirty million gallon, gallons per, per annum. Your co your plant costs three hundred million dollars to build, and a, a corn ethanol plant producing thirty million gallons would cost a fraction of that. But this is the necessary first step. It's going to be more expensive. It's going to be clunky. But, it, it, but that first step needs to be taken, uh, and, and it's very exciting. They need to show breadth. They need to be able to access multiple different resources, because having a technology that can only access one resource is a major disadvantage. Corn stover, if that's your target resource, it's not available all year round, and storage and all these kinds of things is, is kind of problematic. So if you can access multiple different resources, it has the potential to operate throughout the year with a continuous feed-in stream of different types of biomass uh, for conversion to fuels, and then yield. Yield is going to be a, is an issue because obviously already we start at a place where we cannot convert 40% of the input material because the 40% is lignin. Today that lignin is separated out and at the end of the, of the process generally is dewatered in some way and burned for electricity. And, and so yield per tonne of biomass, yield of fuel per tonne of biomass um, is, is, is something of a challenge. Another strategy that, that's out there is the conversion is, is sort of deals with the problem head on. It deals with, deals with the challenge of, of, uh, of rising uh, CO2 and the need for sustainable uh, fuels by using CO2 as the source of carbon and sunlight as the source of energy for fuel production. This, of course, is uh, the use of, uh, uh, of algae or cyanobacteria. Uh, different companies use cyanobacteria. Uh, I, I hesitate to put solarzyme up. If I don't put solarzyme up here, then people say, well, solarzyme. But I do hesitate to put solarzyme up here as an example of an algae company because while solarzyme, yes, they do use algae, they don't use algae in a photosynthetic way. They actually grow algae in a big tank and feed them sugar. So is it an algae company? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, this is, again, very exciting, kind of the ideal uh, holy grail solution in many ways. But this is a long way out. This, is a, this, this technology, uh, for, as, a, as a strategy to produce large volumes of fuel, in my opinion, is still some way out. Um, cyanobac so algae produce oils. They tend to accumulate those oils uh, within the cell mass. Cyanobacteria can produce ethanol. And that ethanol is secreted into the, into the fermentation or into the, into the, uh, into the, fl into the Reactor fluid. Uh, companies like Alginol and Joule are in this place. No, notice this is really the, 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 the field of, of, of misnamed companies. Yeah? Solarzyme, don't use sun. Uh, Alginol, don't use algae. <laughs> um, but, um, and so, as I said, from, from my perspective, this, this, is, this is a technology that shows great promise, is a fantastic solution for, for, uh, for fuel production. Uh, um, but is, is a ways out for, from, a, from a commercial uh, application. And some of the challenges here are water. The products themselves are produced uh, in a very dilute stream. Um, uh, so the, 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 the oil or the ethanol have to be separated from a great deal of water, and you're processing a great deal of water, and you've got to recycle a great deal of water. At the same time, you've got to find uh, a large amount of land let very low cost land uh, on which to produce your fuel. The, you know, if we're thinking here of numbers between, so let's call it 10,000 uh, gallons per acre per year is the production potential for, a, uh, for an algae um, uh, fuel plant. 10,000 gallons per acre per year. Now think about our small lignocellulosic plant producing 30 million uh, gallons per annum. In order for a, a, an algae process to produce 30, just 30 million gallons per annum, you need an awful lot of space. Uh, and you need an awful lot of space in a place where there's high incident sunlight. Uh, because obviously, you're only making fuel when the sun shines. Uh, this is not necessarily a technology that's going to work in parts of northern Europe, etc. So at this point, I'll, I'll give a shameless plug for Landsatec and, and give you a sense of, uh, of what we're about. And um, 
So we approach this field of, of renewable fuels w very much with a feedstock mentality. So a feedstock uh, philosophy, if you like, that sounds very grand, but we recognize that the, the, the technology we have today, or the feedstocks we have today, were not sufficient. The other feedstocks were, were, were needed. The rest of the world was very much on a lignocellulose or algae kind of uh, march, but we felt that that, that still wasn't going to be sufficient, that other feedstocks really were required. Technologies were required to allow access to, to, to really quite new feedstocks in order to give us a chance of fulfilling the, the, uh, the, 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 the fuel production uh, um, targets that, uh, that, that have been said or that have been talked about. So we, we felt that, that there was an opportunity if there was a technology out there to, to, to convert quite new feedstocks. But what, what feedstocks? How do, you, how do you decide? How do you come up with this? And what we did was come up with a list. You know, we were very list-orientated people. Um, we, Richard and I, who founded the company, uh, literally in the pub, decided this was going to be... We didn't know what feedstocks to really focus on, but we came up with a list that described the ideal feedstock. And it was a feedstock that's available today, so here now, abundant, so there's lots of it, uh, lots of it everywhere in the world, um, point sourced, available in a single location. One of the big uh, challenges for, for any biomass-based process is the distance over which you have to travel to harvest and collect your, your biomass. Having, something, uh, having a feedstock that's available in a single location would be a huge advantage. It would be low value. Yeah, we don't want to be turning gold into silver. We want to be doing it the other way around. Uh, it turns out people don't like paying a lot for fuel, so that's, that's an important piece. And, of course, uh, non-food. And when we think about that, uh, that list, what we realize that we're describing is waste, industrial waste, societal waste, uh, uh, forestry or agricultural waste. And, uh, and then what you further realize is that all of these waste streams are either available today or are easily converted into gases. Industrial waste exists as gases. Municipal solid waste and biomass can both be gasified with established technologies into a gas. And those gases comprise either carbon monoxide uh, or carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So it became very, very clear that what we, were, uh, what we needed was a technology to convert gases. Important to note, the company did not was not founded on the idea of commercializing a technology. The company was founded on the idea of using different feedstocks. And, uh, and uh, I often think that's, that's something people that, that it's important to understand. So where do you find a technology to convert gases into fuels? And for this, we go on uh, a magical journey into the past. And, uh, so this is a history of the Earth. Um, uh, so this is in billions of years. Uh, so that, that's uh, Earth is formed 4.8, you know, give or take, years ago, a billion years ago. Uh, um, and uh, just to give a sense of it, dinosaurs come along 400 million years uh, ago and then bugger off again uh, about 100 million years ago. Then people come along about 60 million years ago and we've been here making a place of mess ever since. Uh, so that didn't happen. Yeah? That never happened. Anybody who thinks it did is wrong. Um, and, and look, you see, she does look like Sarah Palin. What? <laughs> um, so over this period, the Earth has had three atmospheres, a very reduced atmosphere in the beginning, lots of hydrogen, lots of uh, carbon monoxide, lots of methane um, uh, in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, then a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, and then a carbon, uh, then an oxygen uh, uh, rich atmosphere. And of course, now that we're here, we're busy trying to go back to the earlier atmosphere, which we thought might be really nice, uh, which is full of carbon, carbon dioxide. Life on Earth is thought to have begun uh, in, in this late Hedean uh, period and is thought to have begun, uh, uh, is thought to be initiated. Uh, or it, it, in its initiation, it was uh, a uh, it were it, it it was a function of life forms that existed that could use gases as a sole, as their sole source of carbon and energy, and it's thought to have begun in uh, some some special kinds of hydrothermal vents uh, deep in the ocean where uh, ions uh, so nickel uh, zinc uh, iron 
uh, a, a rich. They brought in, into contact with a lot of sulfur, a lot of carbon monoxide, a lot of methane, and the reactions that took place here eventually became quite repetitive and quite ordered, uh, and from that repetitive and ordered series of, of reactions over millions and millions of years, life is thought to have evolved. Of course, no one can be completely certain because no one was actually there. But that is, uh, that's, that's how uh, people think about this in, uh, uh, in this field. So the first organisms were gas fermenters. The first organisms were able to use gases as their source of carbon and energy for, for life. And um, it is this ancient biochemistry, this ain't the, the pathways associated with the, this, this, this ancient capability that we harness in our process to allow us to, to, to ferment a diversity of gases into fuels and chemicals. These organisms can use different either carbon monoxide alone or mixtures of carbon monoxide and, and hydrogen, allowing them to, to use, therefore, or give access to a broad array of feedstocks for fuel and chemical production. The other advantage is that these organisms grew up in the context of filth. Um, this is a, a picture taken uh, yesterday in Beijing um, uh, of, uh, uh, this is, uh, a, a steel mill, in, a large steel mill in, in China. And the gases that are produced by this steel mill are rich in carbon monoxide, contain some hydrogen, contain some carbon dioxide, contain some sulfur, contain some methane, none of which are an issue for these microbes. So they, 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 the, the, the environment that they grew up in looks very much like the kind of uh, environment that we're putting them into for our industrial process. So at Landsatec, what we did was develop a process to allow the conversion of gases to fuels and chemicals. And what we had to do was not only develop the biology associated with that conversion, we had to, we had to develop the engineering associated with allowing gases to be delivered to the microbe in a highly efficient way so that they can consume those gases and, and produce the fuel and then the, all the downstream separations, et cetera. Um, oh, sorry. Just a bit of background on the company. The company was founded in 2005. We've been uh, pretty lucky raising venture capital over the years. Right now, our R&D is based in Chicago. We moved it there this year. Um, we have, this is 145, it's probably a few less than that, uh, staff. We've have, we have a very aggressive attitude towards IP. Uh, and we've, patent, we've now, I think two, two weeks ago, we had our 100th patent granted. Uh, so it's, it's great to have a bunch of patent applications, but actually a granted patent is the only thing that's really worth something. And having 100 granted patents is, uh, is, is tremendous for us as a, as a company. Organism. It's not a peanut, it's an organism. This is, this is a, a schematic. It can produce ethanol, which is a fuel. We've talked about that. It can displace gasoline, and it can produce a, a four-carbon chemical called 2,3-butanediol. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about 2,3-butanediol later. Um, we can, through, through changes in process operation, emphasize the production of either ethanol or 2,3-butanediol. And, uh, and that allows us to offer either a pure uh, fuels play or fuels opportunity or indeed a mixed kind of fuel and chemical uh, opportunity to potential customers. We... Um, have followed a very fast track to the scale-up uh, of, uh, of our process. We've started in 2005 with an organism growing in a chest tube. We really didn't know anything about it. Neither of us are microbiologists. We are, we're plant scientists, and uh, we're learning as we, as we learning by doing, as they say. Um, uh, and um, we, were growing, we were growing organism in, organisms in a test tube. We moved into the, into the lab. We grew uh, organisms or grew our, our, our bacteria off gas in the lab. But very, very early on, very early on, we, formed, we were able to form a relationship with uh, New Zealand Steel. And, New Zealand, and, and so right at this early stage, I think it was about 2007, right at the early stage in our development, we were actually bringing gas from the steel mill in Glenbrook into our lab and using real uh, steel mill gas to, as, as the basis for, for, for process development. We were then able to, um, uh, to take that, that relationship with New Zealand Steel one stage further and build a pilot plant uh, at the, the steel mill in, um, 
in Glenbrook. And this pilot plant became a very important part of our, uh, of our, process, or our process development strategy, but, as well, but also our commercialization strategy. So, look at that time from 2005 to 2008. That's three years. Three, in 2005, we have a test tube, and we're all wondering what's going on in the test tube. In 2008, we build a pilot plant that, that takes live feeds of steel mill gas, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we've got to operate this thing. That was a huge challenge for, for, for us as a company. But, uh, but it, was a, it was a tremendous opportunity, and it was probably one of the, one of the major inflection points in the development of, of, uh, of our technology. Because whilst the first uh, reactor design that we put in there probably wasn't the best, it wasn't even close to being the best, we had something we had to make work, and we had something we had to make, make work at scale. And so we, we challenged ourselves to have to, have to develop a, uh, a solution or, or a technology outside of the lab, as well as inside the lab. We had to develop something outside of the lab. So that was the first thing. We, we became the, it became the, the place where we could really understand what the challenges of scale up were. The second thing is that it turns out that when you take a, or when you bring a, a, a delegation of uh, Chinese um, steelmakers or industrialists uh, to your laboratory, your lovely laboratory in Parnell, uh, Auckland, uh, where it's all immensely tidy and, uh, and neat and everything shines, and you dress them in a crisp white coat and put a, a carbon monoxide monitor on their, on their lapel and show them around with their safety glasses at all your gleaming fermenters, it turns out they think that, uh, uh, that, that this is insane, and they've got no idea what this has got to do with them. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> this, is, this looks like a, 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 a university. This doesn't look like an industrial solution to their off-gases. Then we go out to Glenbrook, and they start to feel increasingly relaxed, because now we're in the midst of an industrial plant. It's noisy, there's, there's, there's dust everywhere and they feel at home, and then they see your process sitting next to it. And all of the rhetoric you've given them about putting a brewery next to their steel mill starts to, starts to make some sense. And, it's, and it, so it became as much a process development as a marketing tool uh, for the company. We've, we've gone on to scale the process in China and build a pre-commercial demonstration uh, unit uh, in 2012, we've actually built two of these, and I'll describe a little of why later. And they've been operated very successfully, and we've got some great uh, results from that. These reactors here are about 600 litres. Here, they're about 16,000 litres, so really big scale up, uh, and, but also the, the, all the challenges of operating in a different country. We went to China because this is a, a map showing all the, where all the steel mills in the world are that have a capacity greater, uh, equal to or greater than 5 million tonne per annum. Uh, and what you find is that 50% of world uh, steel manufacture today is in China. And so it was to China that we went um, in order to find partners to scale up. Um, and indeed, we were able to form a, a very strong relationship with both Bao Steel and Shaogong. We have two fully executed joint ventures uh, uh, that we participate in in China. One with Bao Steel, probably the largest steel maker uh, in China, give or take, and the other with Shaogong uh, or Capital Steel based in Beijing, probably about the fourth largest steel maker. Uh, and each of these companies wanted to use very different um, uh, off gases from their processes in our, uh, in our fermentation uh, uh, technology, and so each was willing to build its own demonstration plant. So we had two demonstration plants uh, uh, operating in China. One about three hours from Beijing, another one just outside of Shanghai. We've worked to improve the process. We can show that the, the technology gives a low carbon fuel because we've worked with groups like the Round Table for Sustainable Biomaterials, uh, we've worked with Tsinghua University, we've worked with uh, Michigan Tech, and they show through their uh, LCA uh, life cycle analysis, carbon life cycle analysis, they show that our process produces a fuel that gives a 50 to 70 percent reduction in greenhouse gases um, on a on a on a well to wheel analysis. We show a uh, a profit. We show that we're able to make more money for the steel mill 
uh, by the conversion of their gas into our fuel compared with power generation, which is basically the only other option available to the, to the steel mill to add value to these gases. And that, that quantum is about 2x. We're, we're working in the chemical space, so we can convert our, our, our 2,3-butane dial into butadiene, and uh, butadiene is a precursor for rubber manufacture. It has a very large market globally, and we have a number of commercial partners, such as SK and Invista, through which we do that, uh, at that work. We've worked very hard to develop a genetic capability for our microbe in order to allow us to convert or to, to harness the ability of the microbe to capture gases, but push those gases, push that carbon into new products like plastics and, and so on and so forth. And we've produced a vast array of products, and I can talk a little about these if, if you're interested. Uh, something about policy. We're in Wellington, so I should talk, talk about policy. Uh, and this is where I'll start to bang on about biofuels. At the moment, so policies that encourage the use of, of, of sustainable fuels are very, very, very important. Uh, they they, they create the market. They drive people to want to, uh, uh, to, want to use or have to use uh, sustainable fuels, new fuels. And I think it's in incredibly important that we do that. But biofuel, what's that all about? Why bio? What's bio got to do with this? Why do, why do we have a fuel? Why do we think fuel, bio, together? What's, what's the point? What's, 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 the, what's the end game? Is, is, it, is it that we really, really think it's important that we make fuel from plants? Or, is it really, or, do we, or, or are we doing this to reduce carbon? And, and I, I would argue that it's the latter is the motivation here. The latter is the motivation. Yet we have policies, we have policies in this country and <laughs> pretty much everywhere else that define what you produce your fuel from. They don't necessarily actually define that they must reduce carbon, but they definitely define what you must produce your fuel from, and it must be made from biomass. It seems nonsensical to me that this should be part of the legislation. The policy defines the route, but not the outcome, and it should be the other way around. The policy should de define the outcome that is desired, i.e. a carbon reduction, and leave it to the market, leave it to entrepreneurs, leave it to, to innovators to find ways of satisfying that, 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 that desired outcome. From our perspective, we think carbon recycling is the way to go. We have a technology that allows carbon to, to be recycled. We don't, these days, we would never imagine throwing paper away in a non-recycled paper bin or plastic away in, a, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the trash. We would put it into a, uh, into a bin that, that is defined for the recycling of that material. But we don't have that discipline around carbon. And we need to start having that discipline around carbon. We need to think about recycling carbon. We are in a position now where we don't have to uh, produce electricity in such a way that results in terminal CO2. Uh, technologies like solar are now sufficiently cheap in many geographies that we can produce electricity without the resulting uh, emission of terminal CO2. But carbon is required in petrochemicals and uh, and certain fuels, such as the, the fuels in the aviation industry. And technologies that allow us to recycle carbon uh, are a key, should, in my view, be a key part in it allow us to produce those uh, carbon-rich molecules. Um, I've talked a little bit about the sustainability of our process. Our process allows uh, uh, the production for every ton of ethanol that we produce, we avoid the, the production of about 1.8 tons of, of ethanol, but we also avoid the production of these sort of atmospheric pollution agents. This is uh, important. I won't talk about that. Um, this is important because it's data like this that it's actually driving environmental legislation in, in, in other countries. This is a snapshot. This is uh, the 10 worst cities in India. This is the 10 worst cities in China in, t in terms of the particulate matter in the atmosphere. Out there, we're below the, the, the World Health Organization recommended level for particulate matter of, this is in, in micrograms uh, per cubic meter. We're below 10 in New Zealand. In places in China and India, we're looking at numbers in the hundreds. And it's this, it's this reality that drives a lot of environmental legislation, and therefore the ability of our technology to reduce particulate emissions from, for example, uh, um, the steel sector uh, may well be 
uh, something that drives the uptake of our, our technology just as, uh, just as eagerly as, as, the, uh, as our ability to produce low carbon fuels. Uh, so in future, we're looking at the use of CO2 as a carbon source and, uh, and molecules like hydrogen or even electrons uh, as a source of reducing equivalents to produce fuels. This is, this is a long way out but it's, 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 a, it's a real opportunity. This is much nearer term, and we see an opportunity to use hydrogen as a source of reducing equivalents, CO2 as a source of carbon for the production of diesel-like molecules. Um, in the end, I guess my message around biofuels is that we need a mixed energy basket. We need multiple sources of, uh, multiple, we need to be able to access multiple feedstocks for the production of, of low carbon fuels. We cannot be prescriptive and say we only want them from biomass because we were, the objective here is to produce 450 billion gallons at least of sustainable fuels. And I don't see a route to do that from, from biomass. My, my, my view. And with that, I will ask for questions. This is another way we can go, of course. You showed on one of your slides a full-scale commercial plant in 2014. Is that being under construction? Is it happening? It, it, groundbreaking this year. Groundbreaking this year. So, yeah, that's, that's where we're at now. It's uh, very it's exciting. Commercial? Do you have any, any government's money going into that, or is it straight-up commercial? Straight-up kind of commercial. Is, what kind of prices are you expecting to produce the ethanol at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it, we're commercially, we don't need subsidies to be commercial. Thank God, because we don't get them. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't get them here, we wouldn't get them anywhere right now. Hi, Sean. Um, always been a great supporter of Lanza Tech um, and a great presentation. Uh, but I understood before, when you're talking about feedstocks, um, and obviously you can use these uh, very cheap waste gases, if you like, from uh, these industrial processes. If you're talking about having your um, route to a biofuel economically competitive, then I understood that actually the gasification and all those other issues of trying to generate the gases you need would be too, uh, too expensive. So in countries obviously like New Zealand, where you don't have that sort of manufacturing base, um, you're going to have to look at gasifying other feedstocks yeah. to make your process work, if you like, and, and that can make it obviously uneconomic. Well, I, I mean, I, so what, the first thing I would say is the cost of gasification is coming down. Yes. So it's, uh, gasification is, is a, a pretty mature, uh, a, a becoming a very mature process now. A thousand ton a day uh, municipal side waste gasification units are being installed in, uh, in the UK and yeah. mainland Europe. Uh, there's been gasification of municipal side waste in Japan for a long time. So the cost of gasification is, is, is coming down rapidly. The advantage of gasification over, for example, the lignocellulosic approach to biomass is that we are able to convert the vast majority of the carbon and energy in wood into a fuel. So we don't, we don't in, incur that immediate loss of, uh, that, that comes from not being able to convert lignin. Uh, gasification is expensive. No doubt, but to me, the, the, the pri that's, that's just a, a reality today, and, and, and over time that, that, uh, that will come down. And I do see that the gasification of biomass is a, is a, a potential solution for New Zealand. I do see that as something that will be, uh, that will be possible in, 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 the, in the very near future. Uh, and certainly we're working on a, on a biomass gasification operation at our facility in Georgia uh, to prove that out. Um, I think for municipal side waste, it's definitely a very clear uh, opportunity. The other thing that I would make, the other point I would make here is that the gases from industrial facilities aren't free. It's not, they're not cheap. You're, you, you have to pay for the energy content in that, in that gas. There's no, there's no free lunch there. So, so don't think that, that by going to an industrial facility and using the, the, the gas residues or the gas byproduct of, of that process that you're getting something for nothing. You're never getting something for something for nothing. Um, Sean, Sean talking about policies and, and carbon prices. Right. Uh, what kind of carbon prices would you like to see to, to, to help out your um, carbon monoxide from steel process or using biomass gasification? Okay, so 
that's a, that's a, for me, it's a really, I mean, we've never factored carbon price into any of our economics. Carbon price uh, is, uh, is kind of a, a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, you know. It's, it's, it's not a reality right now. Uh, I'd, I, I, think, I think it's appropriate, um, but I think we're a long way from getting to a point where we, we're going to have a carbon price uh, internationally. I'd like to see, you know, we, we, we talk to, to oil companies who model anywhere from kind of 20 to, to $100 uh, uh, per tonne carbon prices. I don't know what's appropriate. Anything would be good, frankly. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 it has to happen, but when it's going to happen is it's not, it's not really very clear. Okay, uh, can I just ask another big question? Oh, uh, yeah. how, how, how much of the solution can this, this type of technology be? Well, uh, so I showed some data there from, 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 uh, uh, on that world map, and we, we, we see an opportunity for, with steel mill gases alone to produce 300 mi uh, billion gallons per annum. So it could be very, very big. It could be very, very big. And, and what's been very nice to see over the past two or three years is actually very big companies, uh, big chemical companies in particular, do, uh, funding research in the area of gas fermentation increasingly. And so people recognizing that this is an approach that's, that's appropriate, this is an approach that makes sense, this is an approach that, that has scale uh, in a way that perhaps other approaches do not. Can I just ask another question? Uh, essentially, you're using a producer gas. Carbon, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So what ad advantage does the gas fermentation route have over other routes using producer gas, such as Fisher Trops? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 that's, that's a lot. I love that question. <laughs> the, 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 the one, <laughs> Fisher Trop, is really, really expensive. Yeah, so you need uh, enormous scale. Um, it's very capital intensive, so... Um, you're, you're, you're talking about high pressure, high temperature, high scale operation, uh, and we're atmospheric pressure, um, uh, we're, we're, we're low temperature, and, and we can operate at a much lower scale. We can also operate at a big scale, but the point is we can operate at a much lower scale. We're also very flexible in terms of what the gas input look like, looks like. So it can dynamically change through the course of our operation with no impact on the selectivity to the product. So the selectivity of our process stays the same, 2-ethanol, 2,2,3-butane dial, despite the variable nature of the input. So, so with Fisher Trops, you have to have this kind of pharmaceutically perfect input to, to guarantee the output. And then finally, we're tolerant to, to contaminants such as hyd H2S is not an issue in our process. Various other, the other gases that are there aren't an issue, so you don't have to have any, any big gases set. We do have some cleanup. We don't have to have anywhere near the degree of cleanup that the Fisher Trops guys need. So on, across the board, I think, uh, I think we're much better off. Just quickly about, I know you didn't cover aviation fuel, but I understand your relationship with Swedish biofuels and such like. But how much is that driving it? Because obviously there's, there's a certain market in terms of ethanol and, and the rest of it, especially ground transportation and things. But in terms of pure hydrocarbons and renewable diesels and, mm. uh, and jet fuel, um, how much effort is Lanzatech putting into that really? Uh, you know, and what's your overall sort of strategy, I suppose, in what fuels you produce? Yeah, I mean, we're putting quite a lot of effort into it. I mean, the, the aviation industry is one that's committed to achieving zero uh, or carbon zero growth, carbon neutral growth by 2020. Um, it's, it's a very serious commitment. We've got a really great partnership with Virgin Atlantic, who've uh, signed an offtake agreement to, to, take, to purchase any, uh, any av uh, aviation fuel we produce. We have a, uh, we're going through the ASTM certification uh, process right now for the, the, the ATJ process for, for, for ethanol, so alcohol to jet process. Um, that looks great. It'll be, uh, we'll be through that, excuse me, hopefully in the next uh, 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 half year to a year. Uh, and that's, that's a very rigorous process, as you can, as you can understand. <laughs> Thank God. Um, and, um, but, it, but, I mean, to me, the aviation industry is the one one, one area of transport 
that abs absolutely needs sustainable hydrocarbons. Tra ground transportation doesn't absolutely need sustainable hydrocarbons. The, the transport industry uh, can, can, can work very well with, with electricity. Uh, so electron, electricity is, is, is a, a very exciting uh, opportunity for ground transportation. But, for, but, but you, me, and everyone else in the world is not going to get on an electrically powered airplane. So <laughs> we need hydrocarbons. <laughs> You spoke about policies. What would be your ideal policy? Is it something like the California yes. low carbon fuel standard? Yeah, yeah. And we qualify, yeah? And that's just, uh, what, a, what an insightful policy by these genius Californians. Despite all the dope they smoke, they've come up with amazing, amazing <laughs> policies. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, they have uh, their head and shoulders above the rest of us because they have a policy that says we want you to produce a fuel that's demonstrated to be to, to emit less carbon, and, uh, and we'll incentivise that uh, that fuel to the degree to which you've reduced carbon based on uh, a, a standard that uh, that we've defined for for an oil derived gasoline. It's pretty sensible. <laughs> Actually, Sean, I have a, a question. Um, and we've talked a bit about regulatory kind of policy settings, but are there any barriers? You know, assuming you had ideal regulatory settings, are there any barriers for your process here? And I guess what I've got in mind is kind of has no, has no types. Yeah, so has no, has no is a barrier if you want to use uh, genetically modified organisms. Um, uh, so um, ha here you, there's just no way. You're not going to be able to use them. Uh, forget about it. Uh, so... But in the first instance, we're not seeking to commercialise a process that involves a genetically modified organism. I do think, though, that genetically modified organisms are going to become a part of, of, of our technology. Very clearly, I think that. Um, well, we've invested a lot of money in that, and I think the opportunity is one, is an interesting one. Yeah? So uh, a very exciting one. I'm very passionate about the potential for, of, of genetic modification to allow us to produce a route to carbon capture and monetization, carbon capture and utilization. Imagine that now we can, we can ferment uh, a gas that's basically a precursor to CO2, and we can convert that carbon into, for example, isopropanol. Uh, we can do that pretty readily, and then isopropanol can be dehydrated to, 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 to propylene, polypropylene. We're now capturing carbon, we're sequestering carbon in plastic. We can sequester carbon in rubber. We can sequester carbon in nylon. And so carbon, so carbon that's destined for the atmosphere is now sequestered in everyday stuff. Uh, and, is, and we don't think about it in the way that the, the CCS guys do, which is bury it in the ground and pretend it was never there. You know, it's, 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 it's monetizing carbon. And, and I think that if, if you have an op opportunity to monetize carbon, then the uptake of technology that are, technologies for around the, the carbon sequestration, uh, in the carbon se sequestration area, you know, becomes much more uh, practicable or much more exciting. I think that's a very exciting example also of the, you could also say the concept of industrial ecology. I mean, the yeah. first park yeah. was in Kallenberg in Denmark many, many years ago. Do you already see um, also, those chemical companies almost setting up in the closed neighbourhood. So you would have the steel manufacturer, you would have fuel, and mm. almost on the same yeah. site, companies yeah. like Evone Yeah, similar and we're, setting yeah, up. we're already, Is that already happening. Yeah, we're seeing that. I mean, so so now we we're licensing our technology to a, a, a joint venture called WBT, as White Biotech. One WBT is a is a, a joint venture between a chemical company and a steel company in Taiwan. And, and these companies have lived next to each other for uh, 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 many decades without ever seeing a need to, to form a joint venture until we came along and catalyzed the, that sort of synergy between uh, the, the, the gases from the steel mill and the opportunity to produce uh, chemicals for, for the chemical company. The, the microbes or organisms that you use, how naturally occurring are they? Or oh, completely naturally occurring. They occur and, and in nature. If, if that's your answer, then how do you patent them? <laughs> oh, okay. So, so with the, the, the base strain is um, the base strain 
for our process is an organism that's actually, we, we identified it here in New Zealand uh, as existing in New Zealand. We didn't get it from New Zealand in the first instance, but uh, uh, we were very careful to, to get it from a culture collection. Uh, but we subsequently identified that it is here in New Zealand. Um, and, uh, but then what we did um, was select for a strain of that organism that performs very well under the kinds of conditions that we needed to expose it to. And so what we were able to do, uh, again, you know, we, 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 were, we were, in those early days, the first two years of the company was basically organism selection. And that's all we did was just continuous organism selection, looking for uh, an example of a strain that, uh, that grew very well, that produced uh, ethanol uh, uh, primarily, uh, that um, didn't need complex nutrients, so used uh, very simple chemicals as its, as its input. And, and those, are the, those are the three things we selected really hard for. And throughout, we were, we were using gases that came from the steel mill uh, as, as the feed gas because we, we had, uh, had this great rig that, uh, that was on the back of a trailer that would go out to the New Zealand Steel and fill up 20 bottles of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of gas, carbon monoxide gas, and bring it back to the lab and, and, and feed them uh, this gas. And so over that two-year period, we were able to select for a strain that was so sufficiently different from its uh, parent by natural selection uh, that, uh, that we're able to patent it. Today we have three strains that we've patented. It's actually become increasingly hard to patent strains in recent times given some, some legislation that's passed in the States recently, but we got in before that. Can you run the process 24-7? Do you have to change all the leads? Sorry, I Yes, no, yes. What was the question? <laughs> no, we, yeah, we, you don't. You, you inoculate, you inoculate um, the process, and, and so that two-month run there, that was from a, a single inoculation. So you just stick them in the, at the start, and off they go. And then replace them at the end of that. Yeah, or, or just keep running. <laughs> Two months is not necessarily in. You know, these, these things are fairly indestructible. Yeah. All right, well, we'll wrap up there, and I'll ask uh, Pamela to come up and give a vote of thanks. But actually, just before uh, Pamela does come up, I'd like to express my debt of gratitude um, to Auckland University um, and to the Energy Education Trust for actually bringing, uh, bringing, letting, letting us know that Sean That's was, Kitty there. Yes, <laughs> yes, so, so bringing Sean uh, to our attention that Sean was in the country and uh, available to talk to us. So, Pamela. Um, so on behalf of Business New Zealand, uh, I just wanted to thank you for a really fascinating talk, actually. I had no idea what the tech did, but, um, but I really yeah, appreciated the learning about the scale of the transport fuels challenge and, um, and the small scale of the biofuels that, um, and, and the, uh, the potential scope of, of using waste gases to, uh, to use for transport fuels is really, I thought, fascinating and wish you all the best with um, all of your commercialization. Thank you very much.